So uh, I'm going to ask you to clap your hands three times. We're using two cameras. Great. Great. Thank you. That and will for help the record, us. if we could just have your uh, name, Joe yeah. Goulet. Do you mind having it? How is that spelled? G O U L E T T E. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to uh, repeat your name and say, tell us a little bit about. Uh, when, how old you were at the time, and how you met Mike and got involved in the logging um, crew. That well, hey, um, you want me to say my name again? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I'm John Ouellette. Um Actually, Mike Rogers was my brother-in-law, and uh, and I'd gone up there. I'd worked for him before, you know, a little bit here and there. And then I'd gone back up there. Me and Alan Dallas were from Phoenix and Wayne Smith, and we're all friends from Phoenix. And I brought them up there later on. Oh, with them? No, we were... <laughs> oh, maybe you don't want to answer. It's okay. Well, we were a pretty wild bunch, you know. We, we hung out kind of like a gang together, you know, me and Alan. Not Dwayne so much, but me and Alan, not since I was about 12, you know. We lived in the same neighborhood. I really don't know how we met up, you know, but we just did. And we were, you know, Alan was a great buddy, great guy, man. I'm, so, I'm sorry he passed away. But, you know, I'd... I'd um, I don't know how long I've been working for Mike this time when it, when it happened, but I've worked for him over the years, you know. And how old were you at the time? I was, um, I think I was 21 when that happened. Yeah, I was what, 37, yeah, I was 21. But I was just old enough to go to bars, you know, on that. So you and Travis were the same age? Yeah, me and Travis were about the same age. Yeah, I've known Travis. Well, I said, I uh, come up here and stayed with Katie and Mike. I'd met Travis and his friends up here through them, you know, and that. I said, well, I was probably about 14, something like that. So describe for us a little bit about that day, what you remember. You were logging and... Well, it's, it's a thinning contract, Thin you know, and uh, we would space out the... Well, they logged, you know, it's like 30 years before they, the, the pine trees had grown back in thickets. So what we did, we spaced them out 10 feet apart. Well, the natural shock and all that would probably kill two out of three of the ones we left. So then you have, you're only, you're only supposed to have so many of these trees per acre. I guess it's way overcrowded right here, you know. And uh, you're only supposed to have so many. That's what we were trying to accomplish. You know? We weren't, weren't actually logging or taking, you know, we were trying to correct the, well, you know, the mistakes that, that happened from before. And uh, on that day, we were always a little behind on the contract, you know. We, just, you know, just get out there and really bust your butt for a couple of days and you get caught back up, you know. But uh, that day, you know, we were a little behind, so we were, uh, we worked until it was starting to get dark. You know, and the sun was going down and that. And I believe Steve, uh, he looked, Steve Pierce. Man, a bug flew in my hair. Uh -oh. <laughs> Steve Pierce uh, unloaded the equipment. He lo that was part of his job. I think he st stacked the, the, we had, on, um, for uh, like 100 yards from the road, you had to cut it into four foot sections and stack it, and then later on, the Forest Service would come back and burn the, the piles. You know, and, uh, that's, that was Steve's job, that and loading and unloading the equipment. I think he ran the gas and oil around. That chainsaw would run for uh, about 45 minutes on a tank of gas. You know? But then it, at the end of that 45 minutes, you, where you got the handle, you'd have to take your other hand and pry your hand off that handle because of that vibration and just kind of lock on there. But, it was a great job. It was a good, good hard work, you know. It was a good crew, great bunch of guys, you know. You know, they didn't all. Get, I got along with all of them, but they didn't all get along together, you know. They were a good bunch, you know. I'm glad, you know. I like working with them. Yeah, everyone. Mike, Mike is a, uh, a really intelligent. Mike and Travis both are very intelligent people, you know. And I enjoy the conversations they had, you know, and that, you know, at lunchtime, you know, and things like that. It was, it was, you know, about like today, you know what I mean? You know, just. At times on your breaks and that, it was like sitting out here right now, just relaxing out in the woods, you know, where it's beautiful and that, you know. It was, it was a great job. But anyway, we worked until about dark that day, and we were, you know, we started down the road, headed back in, and um, you could see something glowing up ahead of ways off to the right. And I, I first thought it was the moon, you know, and then as we're driving along, I'm looking over here, and I could see the moon over here, you know, you know and, um, I'd spent time in the, you know, I was on an aircraft carrier and that, you know, and that. I'd been around a lot of aircraft and that. Somebody was saying, well, maybe it's a plane crash, but I'm looking at it, you know, and it's, it's not a plane crash, you know, and, uh, and 
the coloring was not not right for plain lights and all that, you know. And, uh, can you can you describe the coloring? What you uh, saw? It was um, it was kind of a a yellowish, you know, and it, it was basically why it was kind of yellowish glow to it. I mean, that's what it appeared to me, you know. And then as as you you know, it, it's kind of like light shining through a lampshade. You have a, like a a white lampshade or something. It kind of looked like that. You, know? now, you could actually you know you could actually uh, when we got up closer. You can actually, I could see the framework of this craft through the wall. You know, I couldn't see inside of the craft, but I, I, I could see the framework of it. You know, and, uh, and where were you in the truck? I was, um, I think Steve was sitting right by the window. I think, or I think it was Steve. I was sitting right by the window. I was sitting right next to Steve. So I was over like this. Steve was kind of hanging out, you know, and I was, I was over like this looking at it. I didn't actually see the whole thing. The whole craft, I could see like three quarters of it, you know, and, and you know it was um, kind of, it was just absolutely beautiful. Can you describe the size of it? What the estimation size? based on the size of the trees that you knew? I were would say it was probably like 15, 20 feet in diameter, you know, and uh, oh, eight to ten feet from top to bottom, you know. But it, it was not uh, And how high off the ground? Oh, it was probably it was probably 15 feet off the ground. You know, it wasn't wasn't very high. They had when they had logged up there before, they had left a, a slash pile. That's where like dead trees and stuff they had knocked out of the way and all that. So they pile all that up and for the same thing for the service to burn it later. You know, and, uh, it was pretty much like halfway over that slash pile. You know, and uh, it wasn't really it was kind of in the clearing. It wasn't any really big trees you know, around that. But, uh, it was uh, pretty small trees. You know. What were your thoughts? Because they, they said that Alan suddenly said it's a spaceship. Yeah. Uh, At that moment. Well, you know what? I mean, I've, I've been through a lot of things, seen a, a lot in my life, but I've never seen something like that before. I ne I've never been as scared as I was when I saw it. You know, I just felt totally helpless. There was nothing, you know. If there had been a wild animal or a bunch of people or something like that, you know, you got a chance. But that, looking at that, you knew you didn't have a chance. You know, there was nothing you could do. They could do what they wanted and there was nothing you could do about it. You know, that's the way it affected me. Sorry. Well, just wait a minute. I'll leave a message. I'll make sure mine's off too. <laughs> it hasn't mine. rung all weekend. Right. I didn't think so, of it. Yeah, we'll stop in a second. I'm from Philadelphia. We both live in Philadelphia. You guys. And we met Travis when he came to speak at a conference for us. And um, Bob was filming the conference, and uh, I just became friendly with Travis and offered to do this for him because yeah. he's trying to put a conference together. Is he? Yeah. And I do some other film work, and so does Bob. So you know, I admire him and Mike for all the time. I mean, it, I got away from it. You know, I, I moved to a place where nobody knew me. You know. And, or even they didn't know my name, they had no association between you know, that and what had happened, you know. And so I, I moved to place and just totally tried to forget about it for, for quite a while. Yeah. And then uh, and Mike and Travis, you know, they, they stood there and, and just kept telling the truth, you know what I mean? And stood up there, you know, like all of us should have done, I guess, you know. But they, you know, they kept some interest in it and that, you know, you know like a movie Fire in the Sky, you know, that's how that came about, I believe, was because people's interest from them doing conferences and that, you know. But it was Mike and Travis that, that it was, you know, that kept, kept, kept it alive. Uh, yeah, kept and, it. and stayed with it, you know. And now now Steve's doing quite a bit, I guess, you know, but, uh, yeah. He's, so uh, he's I'm going to, I'm going to take you back to the forest that day on November 5th. And you're sitting in the truck, you're looking at this craft. Can you describe as best as you can what it looked like to you? Was it a disc? Was it a rectangle? Oh, it was, um, to me it looked kind of like, oh, well, you know, like a, it had angles, you know. It wasn't, it didn't look round to me. It looked like it had angles, but, you know, maybe that's just an angle I'm looking at it from or something. But other ones didn't describe it that way, but, I mean, you could, you know, it was kind of, it kind of came down and then it angled down and then go down and then angled down and then, you know. It was. It looked the same top to bottom to me. You know, somebody said there was a, a something on top of it, but I didn't see that. You know. Did it look like a saucer? If you put well, two it, saucers together, was it yeah, more like a couple of not not large bowls, you know, not deep bowls, but like a couple of bowls, you know, 
to put together. Like, and like I say, you can see the framework through it. You know. So the whole thing was glowing. Oh yeah, light. The, the whole craft glowed. You know, the, the, well, no, you know, the whole thing was lit up. You know, there wasn't. That's the only light I saw. You know, um, that of, of the craft. You know. What did you hear? Did you hear anything? Yeah, I did. When uh. I think Travis had the door open before we even stopped. He was there. I don't know why. <laughs> I was asking him about that. I said, what were you thinking? You know, <laughs> he had the door open. He was headed for it before we even came to a complete stop. And, you know, I was leaning out there yelling at him. But as he got closer, I heard the sound, and it was like a, a beep, you know. And um, I don't know if anybody else heard that or not, you know. And there was a, 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 a low rumble, like, and then uh, um. You know, I got, I really panicked then. You know, we've been hauling, drivers come back, I really panicked. I go, oh shit. And I turn, I look, turn my head the other way, and then the woods all lit up a bluish green, like, you know. And I turn them back and look. And I, the last I saw, you know, before I turned my head, Travis was bent over, you know, looking up at this thing with his hands in his, I can't remember his pants pocket or his jacket pocket. And when I look back, he's a few feet off the ground and he's stretched out like this, you know. and. You know, to me it looked like slow motion, but you know, it, it does like if you get in a wreck or something, it might appear slow motion, you know, or in a combat area, you know, but he, um, it looked like slow motion, he kind of came down a little bit of an angle, then he hit the ground and just crumpled up on the ground, and that's when Mike started to truck up and took off, you know. And what was the conversation in the oh, truck as man. you took <laughs> It was uh, a lot of screaming, and, you know, you know. Those times I was saying we need to go back, those times I was saying we need to go get help, you know, I mean, it went back, everybody was going back and forth, you know, in their own minds and between each other, you know, about what we should do, you know, and we weren't that far from the rim road. We drove down the road maybe a quarter mile, half mile, at, you know, from the craft, and you could see the rim road, and it was hunting season, and you could see vehicles, you know, every once in a while going down that road, well, you knew it was hunters with guns. Uh, my thought at first was, well, let's go get some of those. You know, they got guns, you know, and then we'll go back, you know. And then, uh, but, uh, you know, then we decided to go back, any, you know, just to go back, so, you know, no any farther. And I guess there was some discussion as to some some didn't want to go back, so we're like, well, well some can stay here. Were, and either you were going back or you're stuck beside the road in the dark out there after just seeing that thing, you know, out in the middle of the woods, you know. So everybody went back. I, you know, I was scared to death, you know. Now, when, when you went back, did you look in a group? Did you stick together? Oh, yeah, we, we all, I mean, it was, I think we had one flashlight, and he had the headlights of the vehicle shining up in that clearing on that slash pile. And, uh, yeah, we, we walked around the perimeter, you know, in the area with a flashlight, and all in a line, one right behind the other, you know. I mean, we weren't that far apart. <laughs> there wasn't nobody getting in, you know, we were staying close together. It was a terrifying experience, you know. And um, I imagine the, the most shook up one was probably Steve. He was only like 17. I think he actually lied about his age to get the job out there, you know. But, uh, it, you know, he was probably the, the one most shook up. I mean, Kenny Peterson, you know, he was. But then Mike, when we got back there and we looked around the area and we couldn't find Travis, that's when it hit Mike. I believe he even sobs. I mean, my, Mike and Travis were best buddies then, you know, and stuff. And, and I think he felt really bad about taking off and leaving him like that, you know. But, you know, it was he was driving the vehicle. He's the one that, you know, and why we went back, you know. I mean, a lot of us were saying to go back and that. And a lot of us said, you know, at the same time saying, let's go get help, you know. But it was Mike's decision. And he was, you know, he was the boss. It, it fell on him, you know, actually. And we all relied on him be able to make the choices, you know, but he did every day, you know what I mean, so we counted on that and went with him, you know, and, uh, it was, but it had to be my nice decision to go back, I mean, but I sure wasn't walking back there, you know, I don't, right. Steve said when they hypnotized him that it was me that kept saying to go back, but I really don't remember, you know, you know, as, as being me saying to go back all the time, but, I mean, you just don't leave a guy, you know. I don't care how scared you are, what kind of situation. You don't leave one of you guys behind, you know, you go back. You know. Especially if they're injured. Yeah, right. and we definitely thought, you know, well, I thought he was dead. You know, I thought, you know, I thought he, I actually thought he was dead, but uh, 
And what, what made you think that, by the way? The way you, well, I mean, that light. And that, you know, that light hitting him like that and, and seeing him like that. And I said, the scene like slow motion, the way he came down. And, and then when he hit the ground, he just, I mean, it wasn't like he had a, a muscle at all, you know, he, or bones. He just crumpled up right there, you know. And, uh, you know, I thought, I thought he was dead. So he, he didn't attempt to break his fall at all? No, no. no. He appeared unconscious. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was out, you know. Well, as far as I could tell, you know, he, he was out. You know, he was he had no control over his body. You know, he just went to the ground. So, so obviously believing he was dead and the fact that he wasn't there, you put two and two together and assume the craft took him. Yeah, well, we did. I didn't really at right away, and you know we went and we um, called the sheriffs. You know, and when they went back out, you know I, I thought maybe they'd find him. He's hurt. Maybe they'll find him. You know, and all that. And I, I always thought a lot of Travis. You know, and uh, I still do. You know, but. Uh, he, uh, you know, he had, he was experienced down in the woods, and that, that was a chance, you know, he, you know, he was all right, you know, and he could, revived, he had, and, and he could make it, you know, out there, he had, he had survived out there, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, they, um, when the sheriffs came, and they wanted people to go back to search for him, well, some of us didn't go, I didn't go back, you know, and, uh, well, I drove, uh, Steve and, I think Dwayne Smith and me, I believe, I think it was Kenny, I can't remember how many of Yeah, I think it was Kenny. Kenny, Mike, and Travis. Mike and, Mike and Alan Dallas. And Alan. Yeah. Okay. Alan. <laughs> I got his beer. <laughs> He's a great guy, man. I got had a chest about this big around, but he'd fight a bear. <laughs> I could hit fight anybody <laughs> over nothing, you know. <laughs> he just loved, loved to scrap, but he wasn't very big, you know. Um, you know, like that, a real small chest, but man, he could scrap. <laughs> He's a good guy to have on your side all the time. You know, we we hung around together, partied together all the time. You know, and, and well, Dwayne, I'd met him. I hadn't known Dwayne Smith all that long when, when I brought him up here. You know, but you know, same thing down. With me and Alan would go down to Phoenix, and I would party with some people down there. That's how we, you know, met up with Dwayne and that. You know, brought him back up. You know. It, you know he was kind of, his job was piling up the brush too, you know, and he was just a little too tall for it, you know what I mean? That had to just kill his back all day long, you know, <laughs> bending over, picking that up, you know. It was, oh gosh, he's a real tall boy, you know. I haven't seen him or heard from him, oh, like a couple weeks after that happened. I've never seen Dwayne Smith again. I really would like to, you know, see how he is, you know. He was, he's a, you know, they were all, I said, they were all a great bunch of guys, you know. They might not have got along, you know, Kenny was uh, pretty religious at the time, you know, and, uh, which was pretty far from where some of us were, you know, and then Mike and Travis, they were uh, just straight, hard-working guys, you know, I mean, they, you know, but like me and Wayne and Alan, we were just rowdy partners, you know, the work was great, it was fun, you know, we enjoyed it. Everybody so, was good at their job. I want, I want to take you back to, looked for him in the woods. About how long did you think you looked for him in the woods as a Oh, you know, it was probably maybe a half hour or something like that. You know, I said we walked around the perimeter of that clearing. We didn't go out into the woods, you know, and the, the clearing wasn't all that big, you know. And then you got back in the truck and headed for Heber. Yeah, he, well, the closest phone called the sheriff's department. I think Kenny just told me it was a missing person. He didn't tell him what was up. You know. And when they came out there and saw what was up, they, you know, they got pretty skeptical about it. You know, a bunch of, you know, we're a rough looking bunch then, you know, and uh, a bunch of us out there were chainsaws and that, and some conflicts here and there, you know. So they, um, yeah, they just immediately start assuming, well, they killed this guy, you know, because they weren't going to believe that wild story we were telling them, you know, and, uh, well, they, I guess they looked through the truck looking for any anything that might give them some idea of what had happened, you know. Uh, and then did you go back up the... the <coughs> no, he no, was part, he was I part, not. yeah. I drove, they were, they drove that home. time of year they do burning up here on the reservation, you know, well, all over, Forest Service and Reservation, and it, it makes a smoke haze. You know, so everything, all the lights coming at, at me. You know, I, I drove, well, you know, all Steve and, and uh, Dwayne Smith back to Snowflake in the crew truck. And uh, 
So I, I did not go back out in the woods anymore. Now, I tell you, every time a car would be coming at us, it glowed just like that. Just like that thing, man. I told him, I don't care what it is, I'm not stopping, I'll go right through it. <laughs> but it, it didn't take us very long to get home. We were flying in that old beat up truck. <laughs> and what was the next thing that you recall happening? When did you end up at the sheriff's office? Did somebody come to your house and start asking you questions? They did pretty much daily. You know, I had some conversation with them. Well, like the, when we went to search the next day, they split us up. They had a deputy with each group, you know, and, they, and we were all split up in with these groups. And the whole time, the deputies asked me, you know, and tell me, well, if you just tell us where the body is and what you did with Travis, we can all go home and get this over with, you know. That's all, you know. He wasn't looking for a live person. He was looking for a dead body out there, that deputy. And all day long, I, listened. I didn't go back out after that day. I, wasn't gonna, you know, I didn't kill him. I knew none of those guys killed him. You know, I just wasn't going to stand there and listen to it anymore. You know? So what, can you tell us what you remember about being in Holbrook at the... Um, Taking the lie detector test. Well, somebody said we drew straws. I don't remember. But I always thought they just took Steve because he was young and, and the most scared, you know. And uh, actually, they would have had a better shot with Kenny, I think, you know, but they took Steve. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that I wasn't the first one, you know. They came in and talked to us. We got into an argument with them, you know. Because, you, you know, like, some of us have been in trouble with the law before, you know, and, and um, they're not the, completely the most honest people in the world, you know. <laughs> they will pull stuff on you just to try to get you... So we thought, you know, I know me and Alan were thinking that's what's up here, you know, they you know, trying to say we failed, we failed this, you know. And so when they took Steve in to do his light detector test, he didn't come back out with us. They took him out, you know, I think they had a little kitchen area there, a dining room area. Then outside was a big, it was like the, um, oh, I don't want to say play yard, it was a jail. You know, but it was like a, a recreation the, the yard. Again. But you know, I mean, it had 20 foot fences with razor wire on top of it. You know, and they were all locked and shut. You know, we couldn't get out. You know, we were. It was like being under arrest, but they didn't just say we were. You know, but it wasn't no different. We weren't leaving. Nobody was going anywhere. You know, until it was completely done. We could have refused to take the test. You know, we didn't have to take it, but and you know, we wanted to to get the you know get the truth out. You know, and then. For all the good it did, you know, because most, most people still didn't believe it, you know. The Sheriff Gillespie definitely didn't believe it. I always thought he did, but, you know, on that, uh, I saw him on a show not long ago, and they had interviewed him, and, and he said, I just wish they'd come and tell me the truth before I pass away. Because <laughs> he still doesn't believe that's what's that, that's is what happened, you know. But, yeah, <laughs> there's just some people you can't convince. And, it's altogether different now, you know, like, I live in the same area, and now it's kind of a, like a local folklore, or, or local history or something, you know, people always come up and ask me about it, you know, and then all they'll say, you know, if people come up visit them and say, yeah, that's one of those guys, you know, so they'll come up and you know, ask me, you know, ask me questions about it, you know, that's about my only tie with it anymore, you know, except once in a while doing something like this, you know, you know, it's, but at, at, when they took us out one at a time to do the lie detector test, but and nobody came, I can't remember which one, you know, what order I went in, you know, but uh, in the test itself, you know, I, I actually, I believe in them now, you know, because they, you know, I was in the military and they asked me uh, if I ever stole anything from the, mil from the government while I was in the military, and I said no, you know, and of course I had, you know, <laughs> I used to take cases of chicken and steak in the Philippines and I'd trade it for, for pot and, you know, girls <laughs> or, or just booze or something, you know. I, I, I didn't do a lot, but I did it a few times, you know. But, you know, I had a friend that was a cook, so I had a way to get that, you know. But, you know, and it showed on that test. And when the test, I think I took the test three times. At the end of it, that side gill something, you know, was, it's like, yeah, yeah he, um, he asked me, well, what did you ever steal from the government? 
So I, I told him, you know, <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have. It had only been a couple of years. I was still, you know, could have gotten in trouble over it, you know, but who knows? <laughs> but when we, I came back out and they put me on that yard, that's when I realized that we were locked up, you know. We weren't, we weren't technically under arrest, but we weren't going anywhere, you know. How long were you held? Oh, it was hours. We were, we were there for hours, man. I mean, from, I think, early in the afternoon till oh, 10, 11 at night. We didn't get it. That's when we finally got out of there. And then, you know, when they asked, I think Mike asked Cy Gilson about the test results and that, and then he told us, you know, that he believed we that he didn't say that he he didn't say he believed that happened. He said he believed that we all were convinced that that's what happened. So you weren't held on bail, or you didn't oh, you no. weren't let go on they bail let you or go. anything. You weren't. There was no formal arrest ever. No, huh? But like I said that it was a. We were locked in an, another dining room, couldn't leave there, and when we got out, went to this other area, I was saying it was all fenced in and locked in, so, you know, you know we weren't, weren't technically in arrest, but basically it's what it was. You know. How did you find out about Travis returning? Well, I lived at Mike's house. Oh, okay. You know, and then, uh, oh, man. So Travis got some great brothers, you know, they... And I think it was his brother and his brother-in-law that went to get him. Grant, Neff, and Dwayne. Dwayne, Dwayne yeah. Oh, Dwayne and his other brother, I can't remember his name. Don? Don. Yeah. Oh, man, they were they were ready to do some damage to us. They thought for sure we had done something to Travis. They didn't believe it, you know, that story at all, you know. And they were, every day, man, they were, they were confronting us about it, you know. And the cops, every day asking us questions, you know. They even had a town meeting, you know, which we weren't invited to, but, you know, but uh, the, the city constable then at the time was a, a guy named St. Flake, and uh, he told them, well, it's just a matter of time till we find a body, we'll get this all straightened out, you know, at the town meeting. And we were, you know, you, know, you walk down the street and people are kind of looking at you like you're evil, you know, like, you know, because it was a, it's a really strong religious community. They're a good type group. They're, they're a great bunch of people, you know. I'm not one of them, you know, but they're a great bunch of people look out for each other, you know, and this is kind of messed up their whole program, you know. I mean, their way of thinking about it and stuff, you know, so did, I don't blame them. You did know. that reputation continue to follow you after Travis came back, or were you? Yeah, I sure did, you know. Well, then it was a hoax, you know, because, you know, he'd gone out, get out somewhere, you know, and all that, and we're just doing this. I think one of the stories where we were trying to uh, get out of the contract, you know, and on the, the Forest Service contract and that, you know, well, you know, shoot, all you got to do is not do it, and you know, they'll default you and you're gone. You don't have to go through something like this, you know. <laughs> so did you guys go back out and work that week, or you did not? Uh, no, no, we did not. I went, I went back out. Actually, I worked for Mike's dad. Uh, gosh, I can't remember. Lyle, Lyle Rogers. I worked for his dad out in the woods. Um, oh, a couple, maybe a year or two after that happened. You know. And you know, I'll tell you, it, it didn't bother me at all going out there. You know, I was with a large group of people, and, and Lyle wasn't the kind of guy to stay out there until dark. You know, he was ready to go. You know, hell, you didn't see him most of the time. <laughs> he just <laughs> dropped you in the saws off, and he was gone. You know. Uh, so you look back on this as something you're glad you went through, or maybe sorry? Well, you know. I'm glad it happened. I'm glad I saw that. I mean, it's something, something, you know, I'm never going to see again. I'm, I'm quite sure, you know. I mean, I look constantly. You know, I don't go out without checking the sky. And, and I, I'm pretty much aware of what's around me all the time, you know. And, uh, um, and um, it kind of, it changed my life in a way. I'm kind of sorry about it. You know, I had to leave here, you know. I wasn't going to. I can't stand there and have somebody call me a liar, you know, there's going to be trouble, you know, and, uh, oh, Alan, Dallas, same way, you know, and there, there was several times, you know, we were confronted in places, and I thought, sure, you know, we're going to have to fight our way out of here, because, just because of that, you know, and, uh, but I'm not sorry it happened, no, you know, I'm, I'm glad it did happen, I see, I'll, I'll never see something like that again, I've seen a lot of beautiful things, a lot of strange and violent things, you know, too, you know, but, Something like that, it's a once in a lifetime thing, as far, you know, as far as I can tell. <laughs> For me, it's a once in a I've heard stories of people that 
const, you know, repetitive. Like they're being abducted, you know. Another guy <laughs> told me that he gets picked up about once a week over in Concho. <laughs> you know, uh, I, you know, like I said, I was, I was seeing a lot. And even after seeing that, that's just a little hard for me to believe, you know, that, that you know, and I've heard a lot of just really wild, way out there stories, you know, like at those couple conferences and that. And, or just talking to people that had seen that show they had on, you know, about the abduction and that, and uh, which was actually a great show about that. I thought that was the most accurate I've ever seen about what had happened. And then the way they portrayed the people on that, you know, it was, I, it was really a good show. But, uh, gosh, man. I, I want to ask you a question about a conversation that, if you recall having in the truck, maybe on your way up to work that day or within that week, one of the other fellows, Steve, was saying something about the fact that there was some animal mutilations going on in the area and that there was an article in the newspaper and you were talking about it in the truck about cattle mutilations and what that was and whether or not it was some sort of uh, alien. Do you, uh, you, know, did you have I, any I really, recall of that? I really hate to disappoint you. You don't uh, have any But I, that was a lot of times. You know, they were had having their conversation up front, or you know, and we're having a whole totally different conversation in the back. You know, and if there was talk about that, I, I don't recall that at all. You know. Okay. Yeah. Before this happened, did you have any thoughts or beliefs about UFOs? Oh yeah. In general? I'd seen one once a long time ago, and we were, uh, and a friend of mine were driving some girl home. She lived out in Shumway, and it was a back dirt road. But we were, we were wasted, you know. <laughs> we were driving out, and there was a light above the vehicle, and it just stayed with us on the windy road, you know. It just stayed above us. And by the time we got to Shumway, where the lights, city, you know, town lights, where it's not a city, but it was gone, you know. But I'd seen something like that before, you know? That was my only experience, but to, I'm, I didn't really think about it, you know. I didn't think about it. I'd never occurred to me something like this, my, or, or that I would ever see one, you know, that I could just straight out, you know, know that it was, you know, a craft from a, di a different world, you know, and, and there was no doubt in my mind, you know, that's what it was, you know. I still, I still, especially if I'm, you know, like right now, I can picture that in my mind just crystal clear, you know, but, you know, most of the time it's, it's pushed back in my mind, I don't think about it, and I, I, I had a few nightmares about it. It was shortly after it happened, but they went away too, you know. And, then, and until I did a, a couple of them conferences, and I had a couple of nightmares after that, you know. But then it doesn't, you know, I don't think about it much anymore, you know, in that way. So, is there anything uh, you'd like to add, like to set the record straight? Anything you want to say about Travis or your experience? Or he'll, he's maybe using this when he speaks at conferences around. The country and around the world is anything you want to say to the listening audience at those conferences about well yeah i mean you know here's travis, your chance i've known travis like i said since i was about 14 and and oh at one time he had his own little wild side but he was always honest an honest person he did not lie about things you know and you know he was a very intelligent guy but him and mike both but there was no way i mean, i've tried to think of how they could have set this up set the rest of us up to back their story, you know, about this and, you know, it just wasn't possible, you know. It, I know in my mind and in my heart that's the truth that Travis, I've never heard him say anything that I went back 100% about this, you know. Everything he's ever said, even those comments, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I don't know about, you know, uh, you know, about what happened to Travis afterwards and the, the battle he had with, you know, debunkers and, and you know, just People just want to lie, just so they can get their their name somewhere. That you know, I just flat out want to lie about it. You know, mm -hmm. I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. You know, I mean, how could you possibly believe that we're the only beings in this universe? You know, it's not. There's no way. You know, I, you can. I've had people. I can't quite remember the quotes, but they showed me things from the Bible, and where they, in their mind, it's saying that there is other planets and that there is other races. You know. It might not be what was really, but you know, I mean, Travis has always been really honest about it, uh, and and Mike, Mike Rogers has always been, you know, and Steve is too, you know, 
and when they're when they're doing that, you know, all my hats off to them, man. Because they, I mean, it's hard to get up up there, and and you know, some of those people out in that audience are are just total non-believers, you know, and they're there, you know. There's a couple guys that would get up and ask some question that wasn't related to the the incident, but related to something said or done afterwards, you know. And I had no idea about those things, you know. I mean, I know Travis and Mike and Steve, you know, where they, they deal with this, or Mike used to, uh, you know, they, they know about all that. I, I don't, you know. One more like interesting Like Philip Class. Who in the hell is he? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was my question. Did Phil ever contact you? I don't think he class. did. I don't think so. Now, there was somebody, and there was uh, some government people. I'm sure they were government because they used to drive the old Plymouth cars that, you know, they'd be the ugliest color, <laughs> and the rims always matched, and two guys sitting there in suits, you know, and wearing dark glasses so you can't, you know, see their eyes. They're sitting there watching, you know, they said they're watching you, you know. And I'd see them fall for about the first couple of weeks, just about every time I went out the door. You know, they, I'd run into them somewhere. Did they ever talk to no, you? No, they did not. But did they follow you? Yeah. Well, they, they, they were, and it seemed, that, it seemed like they knew where I was going to be because they would go and then be that same old car, those same two guys <laughs> sitting there when I got there, you know. And you know. Were there any threats mailed to your house? Or? No, no, there wasn't. Uh, the only threats I got were like uh, verbal harassment as I'm walking down the street or something, you know. You know somebody yell out, hey, you know, we know what you did and, you, you know, yeah, you guys, you know, a bunch of, or, or saying we're stoned on drugs, you know. Uh, I smoke pot, or hell, I still do. But uh, when you're out there running a chainsaw, out there you had to go fast. You know, I mean, these trees are, it's big round and they're really close together. You have to get so many acres before you get paid. So, you, you know, you're hauling ass through there. And if you're doing that and you're stoned, you're going to get cut. And those chainsaws don't slice you, they tear chunks of meat out of you. And shoot, it takes forever to heal back up. I've taken friends up there on the woods before, and I told them, "Hey, man, don't get high and do this." You know? And they'd listen for a little while, and then they'd say, "Well, I can, I can get high and do this." And then they would, and then shoot. Well, you got to shut down the whole job. Just take one guy because you can't leave everybody out there alone without transportation. You know, in case somebody else got hurt. So you have to shut down the whole job. Just take this idiot who you know, wouldn't listen. You know, but you, you didn't get high and do that. You know, it was too dangerous. You would you could get hurt real bad real quick, you know. So it, you know, there was all kinds of, of theories about what it what it happened, what we were up to, or, or you know, that was even some lady called said called some radio station saying she was Travis's wife, you know. And Travis Travis had never been married at that time. He had never been married in his life.